guess who's back? Back again. Back of the Land Podcast is back. Tell your friends. Guess who's back? 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 I can't go any lower than that. Welcome to episode four of the Back of a Length Podcast. Uh, again, as always, your host, Mark, and I'm here with Renee. Good evening, Renee. Ages Patel! I can't even I can't even get through the introduction. I just want to talk about Ages <laughs> Patel. He was on fire, as you'll hear throughout the episode. How was your week? Let's start with that. It was it was great, Mark. Uh, you'll remember last week I did an on point description of Nathan Smith's catch in the Super Smash and I got great feedback. Uh, someone said you you I don't think you cut out, I think you just laughed so much you couldn't talk. That was accurate. You, definitely were laughing as hard so hard in fact that you went as red as i look today and that was as a result of me spending a full day on sunday in the sunshine without any sun cream on because i am an idiot so naughty. it is not ideal but yeah it was very very well received um description i think and hopefully there'll be plenty more of that to come in the summer um Absolutely. yeah this episode we have got a uh, guest coming on to talk about the ashes uh we're going to do a review of the second test of new zealand and india we've got the super smash and as usual we'll finish off with our 11 of the week and the poetry review of the week we've got all of that coming up for you pretty soon let's crack into it time to do a Tom Latham and do a sweep. What's been happening in the cricket world this week? Guys, the Big Bash is back in Australia. Uh, firstly, up the Renegades for the season. Oh, renegades the Hurricanes. Up. Sorry, I, th- I think renegades. you mispronounced Hurricanes. Up the Renegades. Ah, uh, yeah. All right. If up you say so. Renegades. New captain this year. That'll be interesting to see how they go. Um, probably not as well as the Hurricanes. Will get competitive. You thought New Zealand England was competitive. Hurricanes versus <laughs> Renegades. It doesn't matter at the moment. The two Sydney teams are taking the first win of the series. We'll keep an eye on that as it goes on. Meanwhile, uh, Sri Lanka beating the West Indies in their second test. Ramesh Mendes taking three wickets and one over. Yeah, he turned that game on his head. Big shout out to Ramesh Mendes for that uh, little performance there. Good, little, good achievement, but not the best cricketing achievement of the week. The Black Caps Tour of India has finished and unfortunately didn't quite finish in the most positive fashion. Uh, so we've got the review of this test match to uh, to go through now. Uh, first things first, we'll obviously discuss the team news. Kane Williamson was unable to participate due to a recurring elbow injury. So that brought in Daryl Mitchell. And I'm going to tentatively just put in there that there was no Neil Wagner for the second test and hope that Renee well, doesn't blow remember. up. Oh, you'll remember last week we made this prediction. Neil Wagner, back on the pitch, is my prediction. If he's uh, not, I, think... I will fly to India and I will <laughs> dress him up in a wicketkeeper's helmet and get him on there. I think you're right. My understanding of Mumbai and the Wankhede Stadium is that it is a much faster pitch. It's a harder pitch, so that will definitely suit Neil Wagner down to the ground. I think you'll probably look to drop a spinner and I... It's really tough on Somerville because he obviously did his thing with the bat, but I do think that Will Somerville will come out. Oh, Mark, I was wrong. Also, I did not fly to India. And- yeah, I was just about to ask you how your trip yeah. was. Uh, turns out uh, MIQ is quite hard to get into. Yeah, fair enough. I, also, we- <laughs> it's hard to fly to India because uh, they only announced the team like half an hour, so by the time I would have got to India, yeah, it would have Yeah, been it's, a, it's, it's a bit of a flight. <laughs> um,. Look, I I love Neil Wagner. I I want him in this team. I want to see him play. Should he have played fifty fifty? The team, yeah, the world of cricket seems to seems to be. What do you think? Yeah, there was a lot of um, obviously a lot of discussion beforehand about whether Wagner would play. Um, I think the pitch probably dictated in the end that he probably shouldn't have or can justify why he didn't play Um, because yeah as we'll go through not one seamer for New Zealand took a wicket but I do think he's a different option uh, that could have offered something a little bit different and 
it would have come in for Somerville who just didn't have the greatest game again um, and as he's in there as a bowler you want him to take wickets if he didn't would Neil Wagner have done anything would he have done anything better I suppose if he, even if he'd have taken a wicket one wicket that would have been something better he probably would have been able to control the run rate a little bit better as well um, so yeah disappointed not to see Neil Wagner in there but yeah. it does mean that he is fit and going to be firing for the upcoming summer it definitely is um, now we also saw Virat Kohli come back in for India to captain that team uh, huge gain for India well mentally yeah. <laughs> yeah. we'll get to the scores in a second so uh, first innings India batted New Zealand bowled or should I say Ajax Patel bowled yeah, it can't really. There's not really much to cover from a New Zealand bowling perspective other than Ajaz Patel becoming only third cricketer in Test history to take all 10 wickets in the innings. Um, we sat and watched day one unfold. Didn't really know what to expect, uh, but I think seventh over, which is when Ajaz Patel came on, the third ball that he bowled in that over turned square off a good line and length and that probably gave you a bit of an indication that he was in the game and that spinners were going to dictate this test match and yeah, he just I wouldn't say annihilated his way through the Indian batting lineup, but he definitely he bowled the best out of any New Zealand bowler and thoroughly deserved all 10 wickets um yeah. We're so proud. We're so proud of Ajaz Patel. I think he's done a phenomenal achievement. I don't want to play devil's advocate, but you get ten wickets. What were your other bowlers doing? Like we know Southy and Jamison were putting on pressure onto the bowlers, and they did play an important role. But as in a New Zealand team, are you like stoked about this? Yeah, you've got to be stoked for him. But I think you you look at. Obviously, Saudi and Jameson are your two frontline bowlers who want to take wickets up top, and they just weren't able to do that. I think, you know, Jameson bowled a good couple of deliveries to Agarwal and Gill where he missed, um, I think it was one where he played, tried to play boom and drive and, you know, just shaved off stump. And Saudi's similar as well. There was a particular over he bowled up top that was pretty menacing, but apart from that, they just didn't really have much of a say. Um, Somerville. Yeah, I don't even know where to start with Will Somerville. I don't want to be critical, but he just does not look like he's going to take a wicket. And that then questions why he's in the team. Yeah, I I would agree. Um, India putting on 325, which is nothing to sneeze at. Um, Agarwal with 150. Patel next top scoring with 50. Yeah, it's a huge score. That innings from Agarwal just, it, it was a relatively difficult pitch, and I think not. Obviously, with Ajaz Patel taking 10 wickets, I think some of the shine off Agarwal's innings has been taken off. Um, but it was an incredible um, innings that he played and set up the victory for India. Um, yeah, 150 in any test match on any pitch is a fantastic achievement. And for him to do it on that pitch when so many other batsmen struggled uh, is, is a phenomenal achievement. But yeah, I mean, we want to talk about Ajaz Patel. We want to talk about his 10 wickets. We don't want to pay too much attention to um, anything else because it's such a phenomenal achievement. I'm struggling to actually think about words that can describe how how irregular that feat is and how, as a result, it is such a, a fantastic achievement. Um, didn't expect it to come. Um, and I think, yeah, I don't think you ever expect any bowler to take 10 wickets in an innings. Uh, it was pretty impressive. One thing I do want to touch on because I got a lot of feedback on our social media account on the first day was the Virat Kohli dismissal. Yes, what happened there? Well, as it happened, um, Virat Kohli was given out LBW on the field by the umpire and the batsman decided to review it straight away, clearly thinking that he had got a bit of an inside edge onto his pad and replays proved inconclusive now the the law in test well the law in cricket is that if the ball hits the bat and the pad simultaneously then it is a judge to have hit the bat first and therefore can't be given out leg before wicket so a lot of comments were provided to the social media account on the lines that the umpire should have the third umpire should have applied this law and should have overturned the decision and they were pretty filthy that he didn't however 
My point was that your third umpire can only overturn a clear and obvious mistake. So I had to find clear evidence that the umpire on the field had made a bad decision. Replay is proved inconclusive. It was missing a frame and it always happens in cricket. One frame can decide whether a batsman is definitely out or whether he's definitely not out. And that frame was missing, which would have been the over uh, overriding evidence. So for me, the right decision was reached. I think the wrong decision was the on-field umpire given Virat Kohli out, mm. I think. I but agree. it's also hard to determine whether the, ball, whether the ball has hit the bat or the pad first or whether it's hit it at the same time. So you cannot blame the umpire for getting that decision or giving the decision that he did. I'm not even going to say he got it wrong because I think it was touch and go either way. But I digress on that point. Um, yeah, India put on 325. Then New Zealand came into bat. Well, we made a prediction of who would have a big innings. At Mumbai, if it is a bit bit better, a bit sort of bit more bouncy, uh, less dead, less conducive to spinners, will probably suit Nichols, I think, a lot more. He did not look too comfortable against the spin of, of India uh, on a really slow, low pitch that was turning. That's my prediction. I, I'm back in Henry Nichols to get some runs in the next test. I'm going to back Ross Taylor to score um, a good total up in Mumbai. We're sorry to say once again that we, we, we got it wrong because New Zealand as a whole batting unit didn't have a good innings. Um, Jameson top scored with 17 as New Zealand were bundled out for 62. I did not pick Jamison to top score. No, I'm a betting man and I wish I'd have put a little <laughs> bit of money on that because I think he would have had good odds to get the top score in that innings. Um, yeah, not a great for performance. Ajaz Patel. For Ajaz Patel took 10 wickets, went for a sit down and was out there before he knew it. Yeah, he had a five minute uh, sit down. He must have been pretty disappointed with the, with the batting performance, unfortunately. But... I guess it happens in test match cricket sometimes, especially in places like India. You come into a place where you've got conditions that you're not particularly uh, adept at playing with. And we saw that in the first test, New Zealand's um, composure and technique against spin was found out. And then that was accentuated in the in the first innings of the uh, New Zealand run. Well, yeah, the New Zealand innings. Um, so New Zealand, 62 all out. Uh, innings three, India choose to bat again. Now, why didn't they enforce the follow-on? I have a theory that it's not... I don't think it's related to the match situation. Um, I commented this on Twitter. I actually believe that India chose to bat again because they've had a few players that have either been out of form or have been out of the side in Test Match Cricket. They've got a big overseas series against South Africa coming up. So I actually think it wasn't so much trying to put more runs on the board to definitely win the test match it was more about getting those batsmen out in the middle with a bit of time at the crease it's not a bad theory uh, the other theory I, I also I have is that the test match could have in theory been over on the first session on day three and BCCI would never allow that because of the amount of ticket money that they would lose yeah. so yeah. yeah those those are my two theories um, and it allowed Ajaz Patel to make a second piece of history in the same game. He became the player to take 14 wickets in a game in India. He's the first overseas player to do that ever. So shout out again to Ajaz Patel. And it got... Ajaz Patel! It <laughs> started that when those wickets started falling in the second innings, you're thinking, is he going to go on and take another 10? Because again, no other bowler really looked particularly threatening. But thankfully, Ratchin Ravindra jumped in on the act. He did. He got three wickets in that uh, in that innings. Again, Will Somerville, no wickets. Jamison, no wickets. Southie, no wickets. Southie and Jamison throwing down a bit of heat. Yeah. Just not. Just not their day. We're not gonna. We're not gonna crush the dreams of Southie or or Jamison. You know, Southie had such a good first innings. Uh, some interesting comments coming out of Jamison. You know, he he's a player that basically exploded onto the scene here in New Zealand. He started taking fifers. But he's 26. He's got so much to learn. He's not going to come out and fire every single game. So I think definitely not. You can't be too too harsh on him. But you're keeping an eye on his form. Yeah, absolutely. Um, India set in New Zealand a total of 540 to win the Test match, which was walk in the park. 
was yeah <laughs> well they got seven off the first over so it, all, it took, all it would have taken was another 77 overs at that rate without losing a wicket uh, but unfortunately Tom Latham fell just before the end of play on day three um, and I think that probably set up day four for India um, yeah New Zealand they got 162 I think it was somewhere along those lines wow. Uh, Mitchell coming in with a 60 and Nichols, uh, I think, just falling short of a 50 there. Not too bad on my predictions. I said Nichols would get a decent score. That's not too bad. I think I also predicted great, Nichols. But it's not too bad. Yeah, I think I predicted Nichols, but for the wrong reason, because I said that Mumbai was going to be a fast, bouncy track with lots of pace in it, and Nichols was going to be more suited to that, and I couldn't have been further from the truth. But I did. I'm just going <laughs> to shout good. out, I did make a right prediction during the game because I tweeted that... I felt a New Zealand wicket was coming and then a couple of overs later New Zealand took a wicket so I think as well as Ajaz Patel bowled that delivery I think I should take full credit to be honest for that um, yeah New Zealand's second innings was never really going to live up to <laughs> was never really going to live up to much when they put on 60 odd in the first innings but I do just want to ask what Tom Blunder was doing where was oh, he going? Tom Blunder must have thought it was lunchtime. he must have done he <laughs> was he absolutely middled it to mid off it was almost like club cricket it was t- it was hit and run but he hit it far too well and Nichols quite rightly said do you know what I don't f- I just don't fancy a run there I'm not just, going, not doing that. just yeah I'm just not sure there's any not sure there's a run there to be honest mate sent him back and he yeah not uh, not great not the I, I think there's positives to take out of the tour obviously the first test was drawn and that was a really good rear guard action from New Zealand Ratchin Ravindra Somerville and you know Patel there at the end the positives from the second test being Patel getting the 14 wickets getting 10 wickets in the innings um, but overall definitely a lot to learn I was listening to some of the commentary and Simon Duell mentioned and I think Ian Smith had also mentioned this at some point do you think it's a good idea that New Zealand, if they can get the pitches prepared that are more conducive to spin, do you think that that is something that New Zealand should look to do so that they can make or at least try and give their batsmen the experience of conditions like that? Obviously, we talked in the, the first episode about how different parts of the world create different pitches, different atmospheres and stuff like that. Is it possible to create those pitches in New Zealand, do you think, with the wet weather that we do get? I think you'd, you'd be pushing it. You could possibly look at doing it down in Christchurch where it is uh, a little bit drier. Yeah. Uh, it, it would be tough, but I think you're absolutely right. Everyone says it's so hard to play in India. It's hard to play the spin. It's hard to play on these pitches. How does a team win in India? You, you can't just have India dominating, you know, having this monopoly because of the way their pitches are. I mean, in yeah. 2021, surely we could just grow an indoor pitch that... <laughs> well, that's you know that's what the likes of Eden Park does, doesn't it? Is they put in a drop-in pitch, which is um, produced in an indoor facility. So you know, could could that be done elsewhere in New Zealand? I don't know. But yeah, it's all well and good to moan and say that you can't play Indian conditions, but then to not do anything about trying to play Indian conditions, yeah. you know, is something that potentially needs to be worked on. But thankfully, we're not in India again for a while, so um, we will take a lot from that test series I think to learn Uh, a few younger batsmen in there you know Ravindra making his debut Henry Nichols will be around for a while Um, Will Young Tom Latham will make the next tour as well so a lot to learn and that is the review of the Indian New Zealand test series we will see the Black Caps back in action on the 1st of January when Bangladesh tour New Zealand for a couple more test matches. Hopefully Williamson will be uh, back from injury and hopefully Devon Conway will be back from injury too. We will start hyping those games uh, in the next few weeks on the podcast. Can't wait. Let's talk Super Smash. <laughs> I love how excited you get about the Super Smash. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to go into a uh, ground announcing. I want you to go into Harry Potter. <laughs> um, <laughs> Sparks playing the brave Susie Bates of the from the Sparks, bringing up 76 runs in the game and a career 20,000 runs. That's like run, 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 run. That's a lot that of runs, Mark. Is another fantastic achievement achieved in cricket this week for for New Zealand. She is an absolute gun and has been obviously for quite a number of years. That's yeah, incredible. The Brave couldn't really get anything going, Sparks taking an easy win there. Then the men, the Volts, took on the Brave this year. The Northern are having the same team name between the men and the women, both called Brave. Fun fact. <laughs> yeah, that's now, pretty cool. Uh, 
Right. Change from Northern now Districts, above. just as an FYI, if you were bothered about that. You should have known. Pones <laughs> <laughs> and the Braves men. Our boy, Michael Rippon, had a great comeback from last week. He took three from 32. Meanwhile, for the Brave, Jeet Ravel, uh, scoring 30 runs. The rain started to come down. Rippon ran off the field to protect his beautiful hair. The players went with him. Eventually, rain persisted, and the game ended with no result. Do you not think that Michael Rippon puts enough product in to protect his hair from the rain? I've never thought about it. Yeah, I wonder if he's au natural or whether he puts a little bit of dry shampoo in oh, there or something like that. There's going to be some kind of product in there because like, he takes his hat on and off and he's the only player I've ever seen where his hair is just perfect once he takes a hat off. Yeah, he I think... Hat line. I think he uses extra hold spray, hairspray. Let's find out. <laughs> Um, that can be your job. On... <laughs> yo, Michael Rippon, what's yeah. your hair product? And the be a bit weird time. if I rock up and go, yo, Michael Rippon, <laughs> what hair product do you use? you be like, who is this guy? <laughs> oh, my Lord. On Sunday, the uh, Blaze taking on the Heinz and Melly Kerr, once again dominant with the bat, 62 runs there. Leah, uh, Lee Kasperick getting a 60. The Heinz not really getting anywhere. Uh, Blaze taking the wicket. Uh, basically sharing it across the bowling attack, taking an easy win there. Firebirds, who have been dominant for the last few seasons, took on the Stags. The Stags were like 40 for four. I was like, this is like watching the test again. Uh, Cuts and Bruce <laughs> came together, put on a 100-run partnership. Then the Firebirds came in to bat, found themselves in a similar spot. Uh, couldn't really get anything going. Uh, Johnson and Van Vick putting on a partnership, but coming up 15 short. Um interesting thing about that game mark was the uh one of the bowlers appealed for an lbw and the umpire went uh, mm, mm, walked across the pitch looked at the other umpire and they kind of went um yeah i guess it's out and raised his finger ah how does that work batsman was furious i'm not surprised because i've stood at square leg playing cricket and you have no idea what line that ball is on so Wow, yeah, I'd be pretty filthy myself if I was given out LBW by the square leg umpire. The only thing I can think of is whether he was checking height. Because I, I think maybe... Think he wasn't the... <laughs> yeah, probably wasn't, to be fair. He was just having a chill at square leg, seeing what's going on in the crowd. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, the, uh, the Stags came, uh, came good in that game. Firebirds, 15 runs short. Um, so, yeah, first defeat for them of the season. We will see the Super Smash back in action this week. I can't wait. Uh, unfortunately, no amazing catches this week, but that, there's still lots of time. That is a shame. I, I was looking forward to another description of what goes through a fielder's mind when they take a specific type of catch. But I'm going to have to wait till next week, I reckon, because I think there'll be one this week. I think there'll be an absolute ripper this week. So I look forward to that. All right, now we turn to probably my favourite part of this episode. We are going to do a preview of the Ashes, uh, which begins today. First test at the Gabba. And a big welcome along to a personal friend of mine, Harry Hopkins from Australia. How are you, mate? Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. Good, Good to yeah, be here on the internet. Yeah, yeah, thanks for joining us. We thought it would only be fair to get an Australian perspective on it, mainly so that if England do win, we can rib you as much as possible. <laughs> Um, I thought we were doing it to be I'm fair. In... Ah, ironically, I'm wow. incredibly qualified given that I have both oh. passports. So, well, that is very true. What? Very true. So you can offer this an unbiased is, oh, opinion. No. Have you stitched us up here, Mark? <laughs> so you've actually just brought in a Australian Englishman, an Englishman, yeah. and a Kiwi who hates Australia. I'm not going to bring in an Australian Australian. That's just <laughs> that's too far up. the opposite way. That is far too off. That's the, too much the other way. <laughs> So, yeah, got to try and keep it somewhat English, English biased. So, yeah, as I say, we've got the, uh, the first test, which starts today. Um, so we just thought we'd do a bit of a preview of who we think will win. Uh, unbiased opinion, obviously, but England. And, yeah, just players that we want to watch. And obviously, it's Pat Cummins' first series as captain. So we thought we would just get a bit of a perspective on how we expect him to perform and the team to perform under his captaincy. Uh, we will get the elephant out the room first of all, though I think Harry, obviously Tim Payne's uh, little mishap has led to Hopefully a lot not of that little. 
Well, yeah, maybe that's why he's... <laughs> From all reports, it's not. So. <laughs> <laughs> See, you already know more than we do, and I'm not going to ask how you know that. Um, yeah, obviously, it's taken a lot of the media's attention in the build-up to the Ashes series. From an English perspective, on one side of the coin, it's really good because we've been allowed to go under the radar in terms of our preparations for the series. Um, but the flip side of that is you've actually probably disposed of your weakest player in the team. Um, is that sort of, did, did Australia have the same sort of thought train with regards to Tim Payne's loss actually being a bit of an advantage from going into the series? Um, I think it's, it really is a 50, 50 because I still believe he's our best out and out gloveman. And I think in test cricket, that's more important than being, yeah. I keep about given we have all rounders that can fill that that void. Yeah, um, absolutely. But um, I I do feel like only having Cameron Green as the all rounder. I mean, you've got Labuschagne that bowls dodgy leg spin and Smith that bowls <laughs> dodgy leg spin, but you're not going to get twenty overs out of them. Yeah. Um, so I think strengthening that batting lineup is for the future probably a better thing. Um, and getting Cummins and Smith back into the leadership ranks as quickly as possible um, after all the debacle in South Africa, I think yeah. inherently is a much more positive thing because Tim Payne was never going to captain us for 10 years. Yeah. If he didn't get injured years ago, he probably would have captain yeah, for a very long time. For sure. Um, but, yeah, for the future of Australian cricket, probably a positive, but the whole thing is I don't agree with how it's been handled. I think it's terrible. Oh. If people d- dug up all of our social medias, I, don't, I think they'd have to ke- they'd have to exit out or cross out about ninety percent of Australian youths from Captain Australia <laughs> already. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, you had I the same some- thing with with Ollie Robertson, um, and then you know how far back do you go in terms of um, you know social media accounts from players when they were 12, 13, 14 year olds? Stuart Broad, James Anderson said the same thing. You know mm-hmm. they wouldn't be playing these days if such awareness was given back in the days when they were going through youth cricket. Um, so I do think you make a really, really good point. Mm-hmm. It happened in 2017. It's been brought to light in 2021. It's four years old. You know, they knew about it before he was made captain. Can you then retrospectively step him down to save your own face? Is that the the perception that is being given I, in Australia? Well, he was cleared of all, all professional wrongdoing at the time. Yeah. Personally, I mean, yeah, you can judge him for having a wife and kids, whatever. But that's not, it's not illegal. It's not a yeah, professional yeah. wrongdoing. He's not yeah. shot anyone. It was four years ago while on tour. Um, and I think making this information public four years down the track, a month out from an Ashes series at home after COVID, where mm. it's going to be packed crowds, there's massive hype around it. It's actually Absolutely. happening. Yeah. Um, I think it's been pretty, pretty poor. Um, yeah, for me, uh, and I know that that's the feeling of most of the people in the, you know, the general cricketing community. Um, yeah, at least people that I've spoken to so far. No, it's good. Yeah, really good to get the insight um, into how Australians feel. I think from certainly from my perspective, and I think Renee and I were talking about this last week on the podcast or the week before. Don't necessarily agree with what he did, but I do think Cricket Australia have made him a bit of a scapegoat in the way that they've handled mm-hmm. it. Because, yeah, we agreed that, you know, it was 2017. They knew about it before they made him captain. Um, and the other interesting point, which I do want to touch on a little bit, is Steve Smith coming back in as the vice captain. It kind of seems as though they've shunned Tim Payne out of the spotlight and dropped him to save face in terms of trying to show that they're still trying to get their perception of how they want cricket to be played to be done in the right way but then they've brought back one of the biggest proponents of the reason that it was brought into question in the first place back into a leadership role you touched before that you you agreed with steve smith coming back into the, the leadership group um why basically why why do you think that that is a good thing i think he is probably the most qualified person to um guide a younger captain yeah into obviously Pat Cummins is probably going to be our captain until he retires. Yeah. Or mm. just about. Um, or until another Ladder scandal Shane. pops along. Y- yeah. I mean, <laughs> what? Yeah. He, he sends a couple <laughs> of photos on Snapchat. Yeah. 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 When he was 12. Um, 
yeah, you know, or he doesn't, <laughs> or he, you know, cheats his way out of some Uber Eats. Like, <laughs> but um, I think the next person, to, so no one else is ready to take that vice captain role. Obviously, Warner's banned. We don't want him in, in leadership. Yeah, neither do um, I. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the next person in place or the, or the next sort of most senior player that would be ready to do it is it was Kawaja. He's been in and out of the team. I think mm. he should be there. But if he's there, they probably might name him, have named him vice captain. Yeah. Um, mm. I think, yeah, Lab- that's Lab- a really Lab- interesting point. Young. Yeah. So yeah. I think Smith is the only person in that team that is going to play that can play that role, unless you have Lyon and Cummins. Mm. And I, I don't think that works. Yeah, it's an interesting point because we were debating who else could be this vice captain and we couldn't think of anyone really who had been consistently in the team. So I guess I don't really like Smith being captain. I think he's been there, done that. But yeah, you're right. Who else does it? Mm. Yeah, you, you definitely yeah. touch it. You make the right points in that Labashain was too young because that's who we yeah. thought maybe was the only yeah. other option, just because of the fact that he is going to be the the present and the future of Australian cricket in terms of his longevity in the team. Obviously, form dictating that he will obviously either play or won't play, but there is nobody really look at in that team and go, Do you know, you touch on Nathan Lyon, he must be getting on now, so he probably hasn't got that much longer left in Test cricket, I wouldn't imagine. Well, I mean, he's cheated on his wife as well, so well, yeah, absolutely. He's probably ex- he's probably excluded himself from that <laughs> yeah, as well. Right. You know, like the, 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 whole, the whole squad's <laughs> dropping like flies at the moment. Yeah, you know? it seems so. What are your thoughts on Pat Cummins? How do you, how much do you think you'll lean on Steve Smith, and how much do you think you'll want to put his own stamp on this team? Do you think he needs to put his own stamp on the team, or do you think he will just go with the what has already been set in place for him by Tim Payne? Um, I think he will be fine. He's been the vice captain of this team now for a couple of years. Yeah. Um, and he seems like of the bowling group, the most well-rounded. He's the best batsman in the bowling group. He will bat eight. Um, I don't think – I think he knows when he should he should bowl. I think yeah. the only the only times when he's bowled unnecessarily, it's not been his call. Mm. Um, so I think he'll be fine. That bowling group's been together for a very long time. Yeah. Um, Hazelwood, Stark, Cummins, yeah. Lyon, and if if someone else comes in, there's still three of them there that have played, you know, upwards of sixty to seventy tests with each other. Yeah, they know each other. They know how, they know how each other work. They know their roles. I think they're going to be fine. Um, I think Smith will have an input on the field. Yeah. Um, and I think Pat might, you know, he might need someone to tell him when he should bowl and when he shouldn't bowl. If he's, if he's thinking about it. And I think Smith, having captained this bowling group before, is probably the most qualified to to do that. Yeah, that'll be interesting um, to see how much he does bowl himself because I guess as a bowler, like I've captained before. Again, obviously club cricket, not a very, not a very high level. <laughs> wasn't when I bowled that 18 ball over. But um, <laughs> yeah, thankfully I wasn't captain then because I got hooked. I'd have given myself another row after that just to prove myself right. But we'll move on again. I actually remember captaining in game and just giving you the overs because we've been we've been rolled for sixty. I had a six yeah, yeah. Ball. <laughs> ball from one end, get it done. Let's yeah. get back to club. Yeah, see if they can win in wides. Don't give the batsman the runs. Yeah. yeah, I think you and me just rotated just bowling. Yeah, the yeah, absolutely. <laughs> we still, I think we still got about five or six down. You got all six wickets. But um, yeah, anyway. Um, yeah, I think it's an interesting one because as a captain, you don't want to be seen because you've got that power to over bowl yourself or necessarily bowl yourself when you might think that you're the best person for it because you're worried about the criticism and being seen as, oh, well, he's just bowling himself because he's captain. That's one of the reasons I think Stuart Broad never made captain for England because he would probably over bowl himself and he He'd would happily bowl 45 overs. Easy. And he'd get, we'd be five overs in and have no DRS reviews left because he would just go up for everything. <laughs> so I think that's another reason. But yeah. yeah, it'd be interesting to see how much he does bowl himself because I do think he's your best impact bowler. Um, mm. I think, yeah, he's the guy you turn to. Him and Hazelwood probably. It, it, but it, I think he edges it. If you need a wicket, you go to Pat Cummins. Um, so I, mm. that would be my thoughts. Um, talking of players that we think can be game changers, um, from an England perspective... I think it's great to have Ben Stokes out there. Um, he showed himself that in the test at Headingley in 2019, he can win a game single-handedly um, from what is a losing position. So from an England perspective, great to have him on the plane. Joe Root is in 
probably the form of his life, um, but has yet to really prove himself in Australia. So he'll probably be determined to go out there, lead the team um, to an Ashes victory, but also do it from the front. Him and Ben Stokes will probably be the, the backbone of the team. Unfortunately, news coming out today that Jimmy Anderson is out of the first test, which is a massive blow because looking at the wicket, it looks green as grass because there's just a load of grass on it because mm-hmm. it's been, I think it's been raining in Brisbane for something like 14 days straight. So they've yep. not actually been able to get too much work on the pitch. So that's a massive blow for England. Um, be interested to see how the bowling group goes without him. From an Australian perspective, obviously you've got the usuals, Steve Smith, Manus Labuschagne, et cetera. Who do you think um, will be the biggest um, game changer for Australia? I think, um, oh, oh, yeah, you've named it. You've named the ones that we think of. I think the Warner Broad, contest is going to be pretty important up the top yeah. because Marcus Harris is useless and will not <laughs> score any runs. I don't agree with that selection. I think Kawaja should be playing who averages 97 in home ashes series yeah. and averages 50 opening the batting for Australia. Um, I would, I, I suspect if Harris doesn't make runs, it will be Kawaja for the rest of the series. Um, for me, Cameron Green is probably the one to watch because he'll be bowling now. Um, and as that fifth bowler and number five bat or number six bat, um, I think that could be where some of those moments are won and lost. Yeah. Um, and those sort of 50, 50 match winning moments are where Australia have lost quite a few games in the past sort of 24 months. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and we need somebody to step up and, and do that and, uh, put in those one percenters, you know, bowl 10 overs, take a wicket. Yep. Or you know, make it make a forty-five off one hundred and fifty when we collapse, inevitably collapse because we're Australia. Um, <laughs> I'll stay quiet. Isn't England fun? <laughs> yeah. I, I, no I think. I think oh, come on, come on, give them some heat. <laughs> <laughs> we're known for our collapses, so yeah, I, I'm not not excited about our top order whatsoever. Uh, but Cameron Green's definitely a player I'm looking forward to watching. I've seen yeah. a lot of uh, videos of him in um, grade cricket. I think he's been playing to get himself prepared for this series. And he just, I don't think I've ever seen anyone hit the ball as hard as he does. He very, very Kevin Peterson like. Yeah, yeah. he's such a clean striker at the ball. And as you say, he gives you that fifth bowling option. Um, and he's a tall laddie bowls, relatively decent lick, doesn't he? I think so. Yeah, 80 ish. Yeah, yeah. so, you know, as a fifth bowling option. For a tall lad, it probably will get a good amount of bounce on those pitches, so he'll be a, a really good um, option. Alex Carey coming in as keeper, mm. agreed. Mm. What do you think that? Mm. I think he's the most. So it was him or Inglis, I think. Yeah. Um, given Josh Inglis was who also, funnily enough, is English. Is English? Yeah, yeah. He even sounds English. <laughs> he hasn't lost the accent <laughs> yet. Yeah. Um, so. But I, I don't think he's ready. He's not entirely proved himself at first class level. He's done quite well in the Big Bash and in our one day tournaments. Yeah. Kerry, you know, he's vice captain there, one day team, has international exposure. Um, and I think he's a marginally better gloveman. Mm. Both of them aren't great. They're more out and out bats that hold, that can, you know, put on a pair of gloves and catch yeah, yeah. the ball. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I like it. I prefer, I'd prefer, still prefer Tim Pan just for this series and then yeah. beat him off later. But, yeah. <laughs> um, I, th- yeah. I think the question mark is up to the stumps. I don't think he's that great keeping up to the stumps. And test cricket to Nathan Lyon, you know, five days, five tests. He's, yeah, he's, he's going to be put under the test. And Lyon taking wickets is really important for us. Yeah. Um, so that should, that should, that, I think that's where it'll – that's the question mark, I think. Yeah, do you think Alex Carey is the the leading option at the moment due to Inglis's lack of international exposure? Obviously, he's done it in the big bash and stuff, but you know, Alex Carey has, as you say, had that international exposure. He's just a bit more experienced. For an Ashes series, how integral is that? Do you think that if it was a home series with no disrespect to the likes of, I don't know, Bangladesh or Afghanistan, do you think Inglis may have got the call to give him that exposure to top-level test cricket? I think that's it, yeah. I would agree with that. Absolutely. I think the whole timing and, I mean, what, you give English two or three weeks to prep to be yeah. the gloveman for, for a home Ashes series. That's it. He's, he's not a expecting a call-up, is he? And, yeah. Yeah. 
there's there's no sort of introduction. He's only really just made it to the Australian A team. Um, my question is, where's Maddie Wave? Yeah, yeah, I'm surprised. Why, yeah, we thought why is he not that being he picked? Be, not sure. um, he's he's nowhere near the near the squads at the moment. Um, he was in our last test squad. He made runs against England in England in the last Ashes series. Yeah, more than capable with the gloves. You know, um, kept for Victoria for a number of years. Kept for Australia in one day cricket, Test cricket. <laughs> Yeah, um, he captains yeah. and keeps sort of hurricanes as well in 2020. Mm. He he's a really good exactly. keeper. I'm I'm so. surprised because he did play really well in the last Ashes series. He played uh, a pretty good hand when the Black Caps toured uh, 2019. I think it was over mm-hmm. Christmas and New Year. Mm-hmm. That that battle he had with Neil Wagner shows that you know if the gloves are off and you need somebody to come in and perform in a battling innings, he's your man. I'm not sure whether Alex Likewise Carey with has Archer that grip. 2017. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Like he's the one that if you're maybe 140 for five, you've got a bit of confidence that Matthew Wade can get you out of that position alongside Cameron Green. If you're 140 for four, 40 for five, are Cameron Green and Alex Carey with their lack of international experience going to be able to live up to the expectation and the pressure of they know that if a wicket falls, they're into the tail? You know, are they going to be able to, to batten down the hatches and put on a decent total that the bowlers will then be able to defend? So it'd be interesting to see how Alex Carey does. I actually do like Alex Carey as a batsman. Not too sure on his keeping, like you say. I've not really seen too much, so I don't have an opinion either way, but it'll definitely be interesting to see how both of those goes. We go into the bowlers for each team. As you said earlier, Australia have a well-rounded group of bowlers and a bowling group that have been together for quite a number of years now, probably what, the last five or six years minimum? Five probably even longer years. than that, Yeah, they're fierce. Yeah. A very fierce bowling attack. Um, as you say, as long as Pat Cummins can rotate them, I think England will be in trouble. Yep, I agree. Ooh, I, hate put... my, I hate myself for saying that. <laughs> <laughs> you put our, our, fragile, our fragile batting lineup up against a... a a well-oiled machine that the Australian bowling lineup is. The one person that I do want to ask you about in terms of um, bowling is Mitchell Stark has had his critics. Shane Warne is quite quite outspoken in his criticism of Mitchell Stark over the last couple of years. Do you think there's a case maybe that somebody else could have come in? For example, had James Patterson not retired, would he be a more suitable bowler to come in and would Stark be the one to drop out if that's the case? I think Stark is first out. Mm. Um, I don't think it would have been Pattinson. Right. I think um, a Jai Richardson or a Michael Nisa that's mm-hmm. been around the squad for, yeah. you know, I think he's, been, he's he's ran drinks for something like 18 or 19 test matches now. Um, like probably the, best um, than not. It's mm. like the Will Young of Australian cricket then, isn't he? We said that last <laughs> week. Will Young, we forgot he was actually in anywhere near the squad because yeah. he just ran the drinks for the last two years. Drinks, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we, we had to Google him while we were watching. <laughs> Noted but, for um, carrying the drinks. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, but, yeah, I mean, look, Stark, he's been up and down for a while. His World Cup was pretty horrific. Yeah. Um, but a bloke that can bowl 150Ks and swing it, yeah. I think if, even if he's not if he's performing at sixty five percent, I think you play him because mm. cracking into your batting lineup is going to be really really important. Yeah. Get stopping Root from getting a run on, getting Root, Stokes. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, put it putting you know the the, the underdone openers um, under under as much pressure as possible. Yeah, um, I, I think you take that chance. He's, yeah. It's it's a it's a it's a fifty fifty. It could have, you, you give the chance to someone who's never played at that level or someone that yeah. has performed previously. You know what their best is. You know what their worst is. I think yeah. the rest of them can can lift with green bowling. I think it it, can, it weighs it out a little bit. Yeah, again, I mean, it possibly I mean, comes comes down to probably how big a series this is that you go for experience over someone who is green um, and yeah, it may well be again no disrespect to Bangladesh or Afghanistan or West Indies but had they have been touring before an Ashes series you may have given someone like Jai Richardson or Michael Nisa a go to see how they got on and if they perform well then they make themselves undroppable and that's the case that you make them to Mitchell Stark not playing in an Ashes or at least well, it's the exactly the Ashes how series. a lot of shame yeah you had a lot of shame got in the team he made a point and now he can't get out of it um, yeah. 
Yeah, but you don't do that for the Ashes. You've got to put in your best team, your most experienced. Yeah. Um, I think having knows... that Afghanistan game cancelled really messed things up because I think quite a few of these players mm. would have played that game down in yeah. Hobart. Um, yeah, of course. Not possible, but I, I think, you know, Inglis might have got a shot. Um, Nisa, Richardson, um, maybe you give an, an, another bat. Maybe you give Kawaja his chance before the series, you know, a one-off yeah. test to see if, he's can, if, he, if he can provide runs Definitely. in the middle order or yeah. opening. Um, so I think England have a chance, to be honest. Yeah, well, I was just <laughs> I about think... to move. I was just about to move on oh. to what your predictions are. Yeah. Um, so I think we're going to go through and each of us are going to make a prediction about the final score in the series. Renee, as the completely biased, unbiased, don't really you know support either team too well, but hate Australia much more than you do English cricket. What mm-hmm. do you? How do you think the series will end? Five draws. <laughs> five draws. <laughs> Nothing like five sitting ties. on the fence. Five ties. Yeah. 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 Five ties. Yeah. <laughs> five ties. Yeah. Can't talk about ties with New Zealand cricketers because they five, five just series <laughs> draws. Yeah. Go straight back to 2019 and a cup that was lost by them, but. Yeah. Harry, how do you think the series will pan out? Who do you think will win? What scoreline? Um, I think the weather's been pretty dreadful. I think this first yeah. test might struggle to to find a result, which is a you know, it pains me to say it because it's the yeah. Gabba. But um I think most likely um a three nil or a three one Australia, but I I wouldn't be shocked if it's if it's more like a two two and maybe Maybe if there's a couple of quick results, it comes down to that last test. Uh, yeah, but I'll go. Th- I'll go three-one Australia. I think England will take a test, maybe two. Yeah, sweet. We'll take that passport mm-hmm. off you as well. Um, That's right. Okay, Matt. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, them both up. Yeah, I reckon you don't need them at the moment. So what's the point in having them? <laughs> um, I yeah, my heart says one thing and my head says another. Um, I think if this series was in England, then I would be leaning a lot That's more not, towards you know, you England. Can't. Of course, I can say that. They can. They rotate it for a reason. Yeah, of course, it's I can say Australia. that. Let me finish my sentence. But because it's in Australia. <laughs> it was in Gaul, it might be. Yeah. <laughs> Nathan Lyon would have a field day. But um, yeah, on. I think with it being in Australia, um, mm-hmm. Australia's, yeah, it's a hard place to tour at the best of times, especially for an Ashes series. First test, we will be a little bit down with Jimmy Anderson being out. Mm. So I do think it will be, I think, 3-1 Australia for me. But I also wouldn't be surprised if we steamroll you in the first test and your batsmen are short of confidence and we're pretty buoyed and can go on and do something pretty remarkable. So, yeah, I guess you'll have to watch this space and come back in, I think it's seven weeks the, the series mm. is is over so yeah, we, we will uh we'll keep a hold of this prediction segment and we will let you know how we get on uh for now that is our ashes preview thank you so much for coming on harry it's been great to catch up great harry. to talk with you and no, we thank will you for, thank you for getting catch on. up with you after the third test and we'll take stock on how our predictions are going so far and maybe allow you to change your prediction because england should be clean up at that stage <laughs> Three draws. I'll believe it. I'll believe it when I see it. Yeah, me too. <laughs> me too. That was more hope than expectation. <laughs> All right, that is the Ashes preview. First eleven of the week. Of the week. Of the week. Of the week. Time for the first eleven of the week. I'm super musical today, Mark. <laughs> you really are. You've come up with a few jingles. That's great. That's great. Exciting. So this week, Mark. Um, now, in honour of Ajaz Patel. I thought we would look at a uh, first eleven I made on the uh, bank of a Super Smash game last week when I thought, can I come up with a first eleven of A names without thinking about it? Like, can I just sit here and write it? And I did. Spoiler, AJ Patel's not actually on this list. When you say A names, I assume it's like first or second name uh, begin with uh, A? Just first name. Just, just for A, oh, just first name. Eleven different first names starting with A. And oh, then okay. now we have Ando... Cliquel from South Africa. Yep. And at two with Alistair Cook, three A B De Villiers, four Anton Dimsich, at five Albie Morkel. Nice. At six, we'll see him in the ashes soon. It's Alex Carey. 
And at seven, Adam Perori. Eight is Ashton Agar. At nine, Anaru Kitchen, making his second appearance. <laughs> he is, yeah. Did not pick him to be <laughs> twice. And then we have Andrew Simons, and 11 is Aaron Finch, who probably shouldn't have batted 11. No, I think he'll be pretty upset that you've put him in at 11. Um, and you've put should Andy. Have put Andy I think you should probably swap him and Andy Opecla Cueo, because I'm sure Opecla Cueo is a bowler. And therefore, I'll be more cool than at five. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, yeah, probably swap him and Alex Carey around. But we should point out, I think, that the first 11 isn't necessarily the order in which they would bat. No, um, I think that would also be quite difficult for our first 11 of wicket keepers that I'm currently working on. Yeah, because who would you get to bowl? So that would be interesting. That is your 11 of the week for episode four. If you have any other players that you think would belong in that 11 that don't have the same first name as anyone we've got in that 11, please pop along to our Twitter account at back of length with a little underscore, or if you prefer Instagram, it's just back of a length. Once again, we finish off with the poetry review of the week. I think next week we should swap it around and I'll do my poem and then we can finish off with the 11 of the week. Oh, I thought I thought we were, you were going to suggest that I do the poem and you do the first 11. Oh, and I was no. like, I know, I clutched this first 11. <laughs> You're never getting your little hands on it. I'd be interested to see how your poetry skills are. I think I've done all right this week. Um, and it Let's is bit of a homage to Ajaz Patel again as we said we're going to talk about him quite a lot during this episode so here's the poetry review of Ajaz's Pat- Ajaz Patel's unbelievable feat the first test ended in a draw and then we all came back for some more we all hoped that New Zealand would go well up stepped Ajaz Patel Shubman Gill was the first to fall then came Pajara the Indian wall he ran down under the pump and missed the ball as it hit off stump. Virat Kohli was the next to go. Was it bat first? No one will know. Ajaz on fire, the batsmen were quaking. We started to realise history was in the making. Ashwin provided some comedy gold, asking for review when he had been bold. Aksar Patel put up a good fight, but eventually succumbed to Ajaz's flight. Siraj was the final wicket to fall, trying to hit the ball back to Bengal. Black, Cap fan, Black Caps fans who purchased the tickets were there to see Ajaz take all 10 wickets. That is my poem of the week. I did it. I also really glad that you picked up on uh, that bold review. Yeah. Quotes. Absolutely no idea what he was going for there whatsoever. Um, but it did make me laugh. Away. And it is just what typical is Ashwin. <laughs> just typical Ashwin Not using even. any advantage he possibly can. Not even David Warner would try to review a bold. Oh, I hope he does during the Ashes, just because that would probably top everything off that I've ever seen David Warner do. All right, we will be back next week. We'll recap the Ashes. Hopefully Mark won't be uh, in a corner crying. Yeah, result. if we lose the first test, you're doing the first test. You're doing that episode by yourself, just an FYI. No pressure. All right, <laughs> if you want to catch up with us, as we said, we are on Instagram at Back of the Link. On Twitter at Backlink with a little underscore. We are always tweeting and posting crazy, crazy things about cricket. And Mark loves a debate, so feel free to jump I in and certainly do. Yep, feel free to join us. And thank you again for listening. We will see you next week. See you next week. Up the Renegades. Hurricanes. <laughs> <laughs>